because it's like you have this train of thought and i'm like i cannot stop him now and if i turn off the camera to go pick the walnut for my tooth he's gonna lose the train of thought you absolutely have to leave this in this is amazing what's up everyone this is car dealership guy you're listening to the car dealership guy podcast which is my effort to give you access to the most unbiased and transparent insights into the car market let's get into today's episode today i have scott case on the pod founder and ceo of recurrent Recurrence, a venture-backed startup that's working to grow EV adoption by creating health reports for electric cars. In this conversation, we spoke about the truth behind EV battery ranges, how changing Tesla prices are impacting dealerships, investment opportunities in the EV space, Scott's bear case for EV adoption, and much more. Here's my conversation with Scott Case. All views of Car Dealership Guy and guests on this podcast are solely their opinions. None of the views expressed should be treated as financial advice. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All right, Scott, let's get this going. So you, you wake up one day, you decide that people need EV battery reports. What does this even mean, right? Explain this to us in very simple terms what you're working on nowadays. All right, so Recurrent um, is is basically a shopper. You could think of it as like a, a service for an EV shopper first and foremost. And that's, uh, we realized when we started the company three years ago that people were asking fundamentally different questions when they went to buy a used EV than they ever did for a used combustion engine car. And it's sort of informed by like, everybody's had a series of iPhones and they know the battery wears down. And so they just, they're trained to ask that question. They're like, oh, an EV is a giant battery with wheels on it. So. I'm going to start asking questions when it comes to buying one of those used. And so like what we do for at the, you know, sort of fundamental level is like help uh, the buyer of a used EV understand what they're getting uh, and that in the battery, like how far is it going to take them? How was that change in different weather conditions and how will that change over their, over the life of the vehicle as they own it? So not to oversimplify this, but are we talking like a form of Carfax for EV batteries? Is that how I should think about this? I mean, uh, so uh, I would not describe the, our company as Carfax. <laughs> you know, I think Carfax's lawyers would probably have a have an issue with that. But I think, like, in terms of, um, uh, I would say that that this is a the, the battery state is uh, is probably the most important thing uh, about these cars. Um, it's by far the biggest cost item, and it's literally a black box when it comes to buying a used EV. Um, so, yeah, so so basically, you, this that's that's the function we're serving. Look, I'm a dealer, right? And I think one of the things I think about is what does that price elasticity look like for EVs, right? So let me explain this specifically. C correct me if I'm wrong. The Tesla battery EV warranty is ten years. The battery warranty is uh, depends years. on the model. Most of them are eight, eight to ten years, hundred thousand. Some of them up to one hundred and twenty thousand miles on the okay. warranty. Yeah. So, how are you predicting those valuations of cars? Right. If I buy a Tesla, let's just say, right, and I get to ten years with that car, what happens to the value of my car when that warranty just eclipses? Prices are at all time highs. Interest rates are at all time highs. I mean, we're everyone is becoming more efficient, and they're being more thoughtful about their purchases. Right. We're no longer in this like monopoly money era. So how should consumers think about that when their warranty eclipses and how do you play into that? Yeah. So first of all, I'll say a couple of things. One is there's not that many of these cars on the road that actually have expired warranties. Like the, you know, the entire EV industry basically has been the last like 10 years, really like at volume five years. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of unknown territory out there. Most of what we're doing is not like oh, is this car going to just straight up die? You know, it's it's three, four, five years in how much um, battery is left and therefore like what utility are you going to get out of the car, uh, you know, over the next three years. So let me explain what I mean by that. Like mm -hmm. a car with an original EPA range, which is wrong, by the way, right on day one for a bunch of reasons, but a car with, a, with an original EPA w range. Why is it wrong? Why is okay, it wrong? So, so, oh boy, we want to go on this sidebar? I want to uh, go. I want to go account, Yeah, it doesn't account for weather variance. So like uh, there's no heating test. So the cars with heat pumps do way better in winter than cars with resistive heat. Um, and so like the difference between, you know, losing 40% of your range in the winter versus 10%, like not at all apparent from, uh, uh, from, from EPA numbers. Uh, it's like kind of thing number one. Thing number two is that um, manufacturers can just sort of put adjustments onto the EPA range number based on kind of however they feel. That's literally how the, how the test works. Uh, and so all the time, I mean, there's like a bunch of material and consumer reports and admins that have done real world tests that like most of the time Teslas don't get their EPA range for even on day one versus most other EVs do actually and exceed it. Um, 
So, uh, you know, in real world conditions, um, that's backed up in our data. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the, once the car is uh, ages and the, the battery begins to lose capacity, which is a natural thing that happens to all lithium ion batteries, then just the like range is lower battery. over time. What's that? Yeah, just like that. Yeah. Now, the chemistry and the back size, everything is different about the, the car versus the iPhone. But like, w you cannot violate the laws of physics. Like, these are still lithium ion batteries that do wear down over time. Okay, so how wrong are these ranges? If they're saying, you know, the range is, you know, 100 miles, which I'm just right. making up. I know it's more okay. than that. But like, how, how wrong are these ranges? Okay, so, so let's just, let's take new cars, right? So like, this is just car on day one, EPA range of 100 miles. Um, uh, y y we could, you could have in, in the very best of conditions, if you drive it like carefully in warm weather, you could get 140 miles you wouldn't be crazy uh you uh on the opposite side of that you could with a car with resistive heat meaning like the traditional kind of uh, heating system uh in the dead of winter you might get 60 miles um so wow. as your max range like that's th that's a big difference just based on weather and the epa test does not take that into account okay so l let's take the opposite side of this l let's just talk about ice right and a regular gas car like th that range can't be perfect either how wrong is the range or is the publicized range on a just internal combustion vehicle do you have any idea yes so that that's an interesting question so the there are as you know like when you use the ac or when you you know it's probably less noticeable uh in the winter um, when you use the heat in a, in a combustion engine car um it its efficiency is reduced somewhat i think it's particularly noticeable with ac in the summer um uh the, the the I guess the problem, but also you know, kind of it's a lemonade lemonade out of lemon situation is um, internal combustion engine vehicles are so inefficient with their ability to turn energy into forward motion. They just create a lot of waste heat, and so over the over the decades, engineers have figured out how to turn that waste heat into essentially almost free heat for the cabin. Um, contrast that with that's electric. why that's why it dries your skin when you turn on the heat in the car yeah yeah i guess that's right yeah now contrast that with electric vehicles that are uh something like i think it's like the number is 96 percent of energy from a battery is translated into forward propulsion so they're very very efficient there's almost no waste heat and so when you turn the heat on you have to just straight up pull extra energy from the battery right so it's it, i mean it's a, it's a it's a it's a great thing that they're so efficient um but it's sort of a, a the downside to it is that with with traditional like resistive heat systems where it just like you have to heat some coils you know and blow air through it it takes a lot of extra energy now some of the more modern EVs, um, the te all, every Tesla Model Y, pretty much every Hyundai at this point, um, some I think the the new Tesla Model Threes um, have uh, a different technology in there called a heat pump, which is like it's not like brand new technology. I'm in a hotel room right now, and there's a heat pump in, in the uh, you know in, in up in the ceiling. Um, they are much more efficient in in essentially translating energy into hot and cold air, and so cars uh, cars with a heat pump in them uh lose like on average 10 to 15 percent of range in winter they're just that more efficient and so like honestly i'm like i'm an ev guy right i'm like fanboy the whole deal and i would say to my friends who live in northern like live in places where it's so super cold in the winter like you know unless you're only using a car to drive around the city like i wouldn't buy an ev if, that didn't have a heat pump in it i mean i respect your intellectual honesty <laughs> i would say so on, on that note, I mean, I've, I have so many questions, but first things first, if that's your belief, right, what percentage market share do EVs hold by 2030 or say 2035? All right. So I heard Steve Greenfield on your podcast last week. And, uh, and here's what I'll say about Steve. Great, incredibly knowledgeable. He and I actually agree on the next about five years of EV adoption, right? So like we both, we both think five years from now, this is, you know, 30%, I think of the market, right? And then we'd start to diverge, right? Now, here's, here's my, my theory of the case. Um, uh, First of all, I look at like all these different expert forecasts. So Boston Consulting Group has has been one in particular that reruns this like a very sophisticated model to sort of figure out adoption globally and in the U.S. So 
here's 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 what their numbers have said. So they the first time they ran this forecast was 2018, and they said they were using 2030 as their projection year. They were like tw- in 2018, they said 12 years from now it's going to be 21 percent of the market is EV. So these are new sales, right? They reran it the next year, and they were like, actually, it's going to be 26 percent. They reran it in 2020, uh, sorry, 2021. They were like, yeah, actually, we think it's going to be 42 percent. And they reran it just uh, nine months ago, uh, middle of 2022, and they said. Now, they're only eight years away. 2030, they think now it's over half, 53%. Um, and then that projection, you draw that forward to 2035, and this was before any of all the federal sort of like tailpipe regulations and all the new stuff, the Inflation Reduction Act, they were saying 72% in the US, right, by 2035. So... I- I, I probably think it's somewhere in between those, you know, where Steve, Steve's estimates and, and Boston Consulting Group is. But I think it's notable that every time they've rerun that analysis, it's leaps up for the same year. So I think there's something systematically that's happening faster than the underlying data would show. Um, so, so to be clear, so you're saying at least 50% by 2030? I would, yeah, I would, I would lay down a $100 bet with Steve right now that it's over 50% wow. of new of new car sales are electric vehicles by 2030. And I would actually, I would probably even go 60, 40. And, and, and uh, wow. Steve, if you're listening, 200 bucks on that. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's great. It's going to be so long before I have to pay out or he has to pay out. He'll probably take that bet. <laughs> I mean, I talk to dealers all the time, right? I'm a dealer. And there's, there are definitely dealers that sell a lot more EVs than us. One of the concerns lately has been just the price risk. Right, like just to give you an example, Teslas have dropped roughly fifteen percent in their values since the beginning of Q1. And you know, as dealers, you hold this inventory on your balance sheet. If you don't sell that car, you know, relatively quickly, 30, 60 days, I mean, you're you're stuck with serious depreciation and you're taking a big L. And so, how do you at recurrent, right? You're you're clearly working on battery transparency and you know directly impacts the value. How can you fix that? How can you help? you know, ease dealers and, you know, ease the apprehension of buying an EV now that in a way there's this new risk added to the market. It's no longer just, Hey, I'm going to buy an EV and hopefully it's great and I'll sell it. And oh, you know, it's nice and dandy. It's going to follow a normal depreciation schedule. Now as a dealer, you've just, there's another risk added into my calculus, which is, well, what happens if the OEMs change the prices? It's not only Tesla, right? Ford changed some prices of its new cars, new EVs, so how, how do you get around that? And like, how does recurrent help mitigate that apprehension? Yeah. So listen, we are a bunch of battery company full of battery nerds, right? So we're not, I, I can't like tweet at Elon and, and tell him to stop changing prices, you, you know? So it's not like th- there is some, some of this is out of our control. You know, I think for dealers who are thinking about, do I go and play the used Tesla roulette game? Because it like, there's a there's a lot. I mean, these are like the Model Y is the most popular car in the world now. Like this this year, Model Threes are flooding the used market. Like there's an incredible no, there's an incredible number of opportunities if you want to go in on this. But I think like there's a, there's a couple of keys to this. I'll say three things for a dealership thinking about them. Do I go use Teslas or not? One is I think you're going to find you, you, you're probably not going to want to carry a lot of inventory and you're going to want to figure out like know when to sort of like downsize and know when to upshift and sort of get sort of like I, I think like watch the watch the tea leaves of of um of what what the the price changes are likely to do to some extent I think that's going to get muted as there are just more numbers out there like the the do you think that's practical I mean I'm a dealer I want to sell cars I don't want to follow the macro like car dealership guy <laughs> okay so then then the easy way of doing it is just like minimize your risk by not holding that many in inventory so th- really think about what can we do to 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 pick up and and dispose units quickly so you're not holding the hundred cars basically at the same time mm-hmm. which I think is like a generally good practice you want to be thinking about with anything i think that just stakes are a little bit higher on you know on on the you know on the used teslas because of that sort of like the volatility right now so I, that's one thing right like two i'd say like make sure you know what you're getting so that's very true from a battery perspective you know like i think that's like a um you want to make sure and and you know the dealers working with recurrent sorry i know i'm not supposed to be plugging my, my own company but like dealers working. what do you with, mean of course of course yeah, okay great it. then fine i'm gonna plug my company plug away plug away Recurrent, 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 recurrent. So dealers <laughs> working with recurrent can use our tools to to essentially understand what they're getting. Like they know, like, oh gosh, this battery is a 
92 or this but this one's an 80 and that's and the 92 is like going to be better i'm going to be able to explain it you know and sell it for more and sell it faster what, what does that mean is this on a scale of, of yeah zero so we just have like a rating system that basically says like uh you know 92 means this car gets 92 percent of the range that it did when it was new and that's like actually pretty great you know and that's not uncommon that happens all the time um you know and we just use that kind of number score sort of zero to 100 but just knowing what you're getting as a dealer is just as important as the shopper knowing what they're getting so i, I think that's what we kind of have realized and are, and are really helping our dealers with but besides the battery uh, and, and by the way, really extra important on older on older vehicles where you're like, you know, that are coming up on that warranty cutoff and you want to make sure that you're not getting something that, that you're not going to be able to sell because the range is just so degraded. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is separate from batteries is like understanding how to, you can't just look at a VIN anymore and say, and know exactly what, what the car is and what it's equipped with. You know, there's like, you need to be able to figure out how to, um, how to identify the software and the hardware that's on there of the software subscription, what's transferable like do you is is full self-driving transferable on this car is the free supercharging transferable like there's all kinds of like more complicated questions that are if you can get good at it like it's an incredible opportunity because you're you're zigging where everybody else is zagging so i i think there's a big opportunity here from a dealer perspective so let's piggyback off of that for a second right you mentioned like other parts of the ev calculus right like is this transferable the, the charging I did some research into recurrent. I was looking through your offerings and you're offering something for shoppers, for EV owners and for dealers. Yeah. How do you, how do you balance that? Where's the, you know, asymmetrical opportunity here? Is it just having this kind of, you know, all in one bundled marketplace or service that, that, you know, is able to tackle every part of the market? I always think about like, you know, are we horizontally integrating? Are we vertically integrating? Like where are we, you know, where are we building that moat and how are we becoming a stronger company that's providing more value? Yeah. Well, there's sort of a, there's a, there's a, there's a flywheel here. here. So I, I think that, yeah, we, we do, we are trying to serve three different audiences, but let me just like walk through why they're all connected. So I already talked about what we do for what we do for a shopper. Like you, you show up at a use uh, car dealer or interact on their website. Um, and um, anyone who wants to take a look, as long as I'm in the plugging mode, you can go to Dell Grand Automotive Group and see what recurrent reports look like from a retail perspective as they as they um, they do. Those guys sell a lot of used EVs like to everybody in Silicon Valley and uh, and they're using they're working with us. Right. So um, but it answers those questions that shoppers have from a dealer perspective. Um, you know, there's this it's. it's it's mostly the same offering, I will say, is like, you know, we've seen that dealers that uh, that use our reports and, and help uh, w in the retail side, they sell their cars faster, they set expectations with um, their buyers. So like, you know, to go back to what we talked about earlier, a car, an EPA, a car with an EPA range of 250 miles that gets 220 today is great. It's fine. Most people drive 30 miles a day. Like you don't need any of that right now. However, if you were expecting 250 and what you get is 220, like you might be pretty mad, you know, and you might show up at the dealership and return the car. Now we've seen like our dealers working with us, they walk customers through, this is what you're going to get. Like you, like you'd walk a customer through a Carfax report and, and all of a sudden customers having their expectations set, they're like, yeah, great. I understand what I'm getting. And they don't return the car. Um, and then, and then from a dealer perspective, also like how to value and price used EVs, like, which are no longer the, the right way of thinking about this, like don't price a car with high mileage lower because, you know, what if that car just had a battery replacement, like every Chevy Bolt ever made, like you have a Chevy Bolt with 75,000 miles on it with a, with a, with a battery that's brand new, higher capacity than what it had when it was new. And it gets more range than it did when it was new. So like, there's just this like absolute disconnect of, of um, kind of the value of a used EV compared to its odometer number at this point. So that's the like kind of you can kind of obviously I think that the the shopper questions and the dealer sort of like experience pretty aligned, and then the last thing is the owner piece of this. We actually the funny thing is like we started the company originally with an owner product, and that's like if you're an EV owner, you can come and sign up on our website for free to track your car's data, basically your battery data, and that's really cool for for us from a data perspective. That's really what comes now. We have fifteen thousand cars that are actively on our platform. They're feeding us data wirelessly every you know, streaming data over the uh, you know over the internet every day 
And it allows us to basically get this really big comparison set of cars to, to kind of compare to when we see a car show up at a used car dealer. Um, yeah, you're, but, like the, you're like the ancestry.com of uh, EV batteries. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's our new motto right there. <laughs> But um, yeah, but the other thing is that when it turns out from an owner perspective, like when we've been tracking the data all the way along, when they go to sell their car, like we have kind of like their car's permanent record. And so when they choose like, hey, I want to sell it, they they can share their recurrent reports and they're selling their car for hundreds of thousands of dollars more because there's no uncertainty about the battery. Mm-hmm. So it all kind of feeds together, I think. And actually what we're doing now with with uh, with some of our dealers is we're actually doing a you know turn, turn doing a connection thing where um, just you know from a dealer perspective it looks like a, a for sale by owner lead gen business mm-hmm. where it's just like hey when we have people in our fleet who have been taking really good care of their batteries and we've got all the data and they're like yeah I'm ready to sell we're doing kind of like matchmaking and and uh, and it looks like it's just a new source for for dealers to to acquire um, great inventory. So that's, I think that's like ends up being the circular flywheel that, that we're, that we're doing across all those parties. Is there like a point, where is the point with the most meaningful drop in valuation from like a battery score, right? Like, is it like 65? Like at that point, I would just not buy a car below that. Like you're going to, there's a highly likely you're going to have to replace the battery, right? As a dealer, frankly, and a consumer, like I would be curious to know, like where, at what point should I not touch that car? Obviously there's a price to everything, but I don't want to go and start replacing batteries. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what I'll say is that, that, you know, most EVs that we see and we score and like everything, all the used EVs running through Odessa from an auction perspective, are getting recurrent scores on them. So like we're seeing a lot of stuff that's pretty varied. Um, and, um, uh, you know, most of what we're seeing is in the nineties, a little bit in the eighties, like all of that's fine. I would say what I would, you know, as a dealer and as a, as a shopper, I would say like, you know, really a car that's a couple of years old, like there's not too much of a difference that's going to happen there. As you get into three, four, five, six year old car, like there's, there's, there, there, there's just more variance. Right. And so you could have, a, a two cars, EPA of 260 and now one of them is 180 and one of them is 210 like they're both fine you're not gonna have to do a battery replacement you know on those but like you should pay more for the 210 because you're gonna get more utility out of it you know and that's I think where what we're seeing it, it just it and then not to put words in your mouth, these are totally my words, but it just sounds Here, like the you EPA already came up are, with the ancestry.com thing. So I, I'm like, all no, well, yeah, I, I was gonna say, like, it just feels to me like the EPA ratings are a scam. It's um, like, and, and I'm not even blaming the EPA. It's right. just like, it's like, how can you really have any confidence in that? I mean, you know. I, I think that the, the, no, they're not a scam. They, they run a, a standardized protocol and they, you know, they, they are following that protocol. I just don't think that that protocol is particularly, it just doesn't match up with a real world rating. So in the same way that like miles per gallon, you know, it differs in different sort of conditions. I think that's like, the EPA probably didn't start out that way. I actually don't really know, like the highway number and the city street number. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I, I think that it would be helpful to 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 have e- EPA winter versus EPA summer. I think uh, from a range perspective, I think that'd be really interesting because I think it would it would all honestly cause more people to um, more automakers to sort of like think about gosh, like the, what's their winter range, you know, loss, which we actually did a whole, I mean, that was like, we, you, you asked about the research that we've been doing. So one of the other things we do with all the data that's streaming off of these cars is we pull together aggregate research pieces and, and publish them. And so like in December, we did a thing essentially like model by model, what's the range loss for all these different EVs in the, in the dead of winter, which, you know, like no one else is publishing that data, but we're sitting there looking at it and we're like, well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, call a ball of all and a strike a strike when when one car loses 40 percent in the in the winter and another car because it has resistive heat and another car only loses 10 percent like that's valuable information that's not just relevant to a used shopper that's relevant to a new ev shopper you have this very intimate insight into the segment it's very clear that what you're working on now is extremely necessary and the market needs it so where are the picks and shovels now within the space and from your insights you're so close to this Right. Where are the opportunities? Um, Let me throw two ideas out here. One is uh, one for dealers, I think. It's not an investor question, but it's an opportunity from the dealer perspective that I don't think people are thinking about yet. 
Uh, and the second one I'll do is sort of like, I think there's another company that probably needs to exist. And I don't know that we do it. We got a lot going on, right? So, so investors, entrepreneurs, like go for the second idea that I'm going to say. From a dealer perspective, um, I'm going to talk about tax credits for a minute. And I know dealers are not so excited about this, but bear with me for a second. Every single story I've ever read about the uh, EV tax credit is all about the new side, right? Like the where's the battery made, like what's qualifying for the full 7,500, all these questions, right? Uh, as a part of the last year's Inflation Reduction Act, they put in the first time ever the federal government has stuck a tax credit on used cars, right? Now, for, basics are like it's $4,000 tax credit uh, on a car up to... Uh, sort of like a, a certain purchase price and there's income limits. There's no battery source sourcing requirements. doesn't matter. The only thing is like, it's only like a car can't be transferred, you know, more than once and get the thing again. So, but the really key piece of that uh, from a dealer perspective, which I think actually has a, an opportunity to, to just transform and grow the dealership sort of share of the, of the used car sales is uh, every car that gets one of these credits has to be sold by a dealer. It doesn't apply to private party sales. And so like that's half the market all of a sudden that like the dealership industry has a chance to pick up like a whole bunch more cars. So all of a sudden there's a $4,000 sort of like a cost advantage that a dealer has basically. Um, so I, I think that that's like that, that if, if dealers can sort of like kind of get past the, all the price volatility and the stuff like that. Like this is a 10 year long program that could double the size of the used car market for them. Like that's a big deal. So you're, so you're basically saying that dealers have a cost advantage when it comes to selling used EVs because they qualify for a credit that a private party sale does not. Uh, it's the, the, so it's, it's the buyer from the dealership can get that $4,000 tax credit and a, and they, and a buyer from a private party sale cannot get that. Yes. So, wow. so it, it translates to, you know, and it right now in 2023, it's a, it's a, um, it's a tax, you know, form that the buyer has to fill out starting January, 2024. Uh, I don't know the mechanism, but, it, but it's, it's a cash in the hood, sort of like point of sale rebate, basically that like, uh, income qualified buyer, which actually is pretty generous. Like you, you can make up to $150,000 married fi filing jointly and still take this tax credit. Like, uh, and and the dealer will be able to just like discount the price by four thousand dollars and then get you wow. know get a check from the government for that four thousand dollars like now yeah we got to figure out how how exactly that works but like that all of a sudden makes it such that the all the whole dealer economics like could work and have a, have an advantage over a private party sale you know so so I, again being unbiased here right like wh why only dealers right like why can't you get this credit as a private party sale so i think what the government did was they said they were like you can imagine like if i'm your you know i'm like hey cousin i'll send it, i'll sell you my car this year you sell it back to me next year we both get four thousand dollar tax credits like i just i think of a the the government was like we need sort of a uh, um, a business entity involved in this in order to make sure it's not like there's not just rampant fraud um so i suspect that's why that happened it's crazy because you know I'm thinking here. It sounds it sounds like there's some opportunity here as well, like almost like some, you know, officially licensed dealer as a middleman that facilitates these transactions for consumers, not in for the purpose of cheating the system, rather creating a, a platform specifically for people that want to sell private party legitimately. Right, you have some verifications in place, but you want to still get that credit. Yeah. And so it just sounds to me like there's some opportunity there. And All right. So you're right. So there, they may be there, you know, you're thinking about, <laughs> you, you, you took it to the second question of where's the investment, where's the, where's the startup opportunity? Like maybe I, I think there is something there. The other thing though, is like the research has generally shown that, that because EVs are still pretty new and a little, you know, the tech is brand new that, um, people are still more likely to want to buy from a dealer because they sort of feel like I have more recourse than like meeting some guy in the Walmart parking lot and, you know, writing a cashier's check or whatever, you know, there's You're just saying for, for EVs specifically for EVs, people, yeah, shoppers are more inclined to buy from a dealer and they're also more inclined compared to ice cars to, to pick up an extended warranty on, on, on EVs than they are for oh, ice wow. cars. So yeah, like, yeah. So it's like, I just, I, I think that like, there, there are some dealerships that are like, yeah, like they're just, they're working through this tech change and finding new opportunities here. And there are other dealerships that 
I, in my opinion, are cut like are just like cutting off their nose to spite their face kind of thing, and just be like, ah, the EV screw them, and and not seeing the opportunities that I think some folks are out there that are they're going for them, you know. So that's what I would say. Fascinating. Here's another thing that comes to mind when I think about your company. I'm thinking about like a healthcare company, like a you know insurance company, and if I create you know something or a way, right? If you prove that doing X, Y, Z lowers fatalities or, you know, obviously, you no, know, not smoking, you have less deaths and, or, you know, less sicknesses, blah, blah, blah. And so the healthcare company is incentivized to, you know, for you not to smoke and whatnot. It saves them money. So I'm trying to think, like, is there a way for you to do some play like that, right? You've, you're clearly providing value to dealers and, and others in helping them, you know, mitigate losses. And so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let you, you know, respond. You know, coming into this industry, I did not appreciate how many different players would be, you know, needed to sort of transform their businesses based on, you know, the physical change in cars. And so I thought, well, there's dealerships, there's uh, shoppers, that's it, right? I'm not an, I'm, and I didn't come from the auto sort of industry, I came from climate tech, right? And so this is like the past three years have just been a very rapid learning experience. And I've tried to surround myself with a lot of people that have been in the auto industry for a long time. Um, so, you know, learning, learning the applicability of on the wholesale side, on the fleet side, like they're sort of like there, we've got folks we're engaging with on both those fronts. Um, we've now had a bunch of conversations with insurance companies that want to do what you're doing is like kind of price discriminate on risk and, and the value of the asset, which I think like right now the battery state is in a really important piece of that extended warranty companies, financing companies, there's just like so many different players. Uh, and JMA actually is an investor of ours. So like, you know, oh, there's like, look at that. yeah, so there's like, <laughs> I didn't know that <laughs> there are, there's a lot of that happening right now. Uh, oh, so you're I, way ahead I, of me. <laughs> I don't think that there are any, um, there may be one nascent extended warranty offering for EVs that actually covers the battery. Um, and there, there's all kinds of restrictions on that, but like, there's just, it's very, very early and no one feels like they have the data yet for that. Um, and I think, um, I think, I think that is an op absolutely an opportunity for us moving forward. As a dealer, how does my workflow change over the next couple of years when it comes to buying EVs or is, is something like recurrent plugged in natively to my workflow, to my systems, um, you know, whether it be auction or, you know, buying from wherever, right? Does this just get plugged in just like there's a condition report on a car, right? Then there's like a EV report. Is that yeah. what, is that what the future looks like? I, I think that, and, and, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say one more thing, like, okay. is Mannheim capable of creating that type of experience built in natively to the point where it really de-risks the buying experience for dealers? What do you think? So um, I do think that this of this eventually does become one of the things you look at. You look at the auto check score. You look at you know the the Carfax like record. You know the, the Experian um, you know history adjusted. You know history. You know like was it in accents or whatever. Uh, black book value, whatever. And then you also, for EVs, you look at the EV battery score. I don't think it's going to be like, we're trying to not make it super complicated because it's one element of, you know, electric vehicles are still vehicles, right? And so um, I think this is one element that, that is super important. That's absolutely going to be, you know, something you're looking at from a dealer perspective. Right now, it's not really integrated. We're not really integrated into like everywhere, but it shows up in the Desta reports. It shows up in like any car that any of our dealers buys. They have a little like easy iPhone widget to like to to check the battery um, just by looking at the dashboard basically and comparing it to all the cars we have. I think over time that does that just like that finds its way into every sort of thing, every every different channel. Um, and um, yeah, like I, I think we're, you know, I know we're the, we're the first mover here and the first put points on the board. We've been doing this three years and have all this data to show for it. So um, yeah, hopefully we end up as the stand, standard for this, but you know, I don't know, the, the problem is real, right? And so I think that like we're, I think we're a great solution and we're out there uh, with points on the board everywhere and, but we'll see what, what the market mm -hmm. says. In the spirit of having a balanced conversation, I mean, I think we clearly know the bull case of EVs and it's clear that, you know, adoption is increasing and market share is growing. What is the bear case about the EV world and adoption for the future? Well, 
what I, here's what I would say is like today, and this this is going to change very quickly over the next sort of like couple of years, right? But right now, public charging, public fast charging outside of the Tesla network kind of sucks. Like, and so it, it's really, I mean, I so I've, I drive a, a Volkswagen ID4. It's a great car, super cool car. I, I was going to tra- ask you that question. Yeah, no, yeah, so great. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> we'll skip to that, right? Um, I, interestingly, I didn't have that car when I started the company. I drove a, I drive uh, my other car's a Subaru Outback, like you know, like a good any good Seattle <laughs> Seattle customer of like yeah, Subaru. I, I, I tweeted about that before. So yeah, you gotcha. Fit, uh, yeah, you fit the bill. <laughs> I, oh my god, do I ever fit the bill? Basically, um, so uh, but but you know, I've charged that car. Um, I've free three free years of charging with Electrify America. You know, with that I got with the car a year and a half ago. I've charged it uh, publicly four times, like in a year and a half, and um, it just because like. I have a level two charger in my house. Like I don't even really need it. Honestly, I could probably be on a level one and um, I always leave the house full. So like I almost never, the only time I've ever have to, what's the difference from a level one to level two charger? Sorry. Yeah. So level one is just like you plug it into a wall outlet. Like that's it. Right. Level two is like the kind where, where it's like, it's, it's on, it's on a 220 uh, volt uh, circuit. And then you either have a, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 amp, like, um, power going to it. So like, um, I think ours is like a 30 amp circuit or whatever. So that, but those are the level two. And then, and then that's, and then, uh, level three or DC fast charging is what like the Tesla superchargers, what the, most of the Electrify America EV go stations are. Um, not actually that's not most, um, but it's, but some, but that's, that's what's getting built out from a public charging perspective, the kind where you can like Mm -hmm. stop at the highway rest stop or at the Walmart parking lot and put, you know, charge your car from, you know, 30 to 80% in like 15 minutes, you know, that's, that's a DC fast charging. And like right now the, that, that infrastructure is not good, you know, like even as an EV fanboy, like it, I just, I've had terrible experiences, even the four times I've done that, right? Like it doesn't really work well. Right. And so there's a lot that has to change with that. But here's my thing is like, and this gets back to the, like Stephen Mai's argument about adoption, like the first, in my opinion, the first 50% of EV adoption, like could have, and I'm not talking just like uh, sales, I'm talking like vehicles in the car park, like, you know, like the first 50% could basically happen now, like one of every two cars, you know, with everybody with a, with a house, right, with a, with a garage or a driveway could be in an EV without any change to public charging, right? You can't get rid of your second car, your ICE car until then, but like, you know, the average trip is 30 miles a day, like, you know, you, 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 that's pretty easy to get with, with, with essentially the tech that's out there now and, the, and just plug it into your wall. No problem. You know, I think the biggest issue I see there, it seems like unless there's some crazy disruption in the EV space and we really do get, you know, massive price cuts and it becomes more affordable, it just seems like, you know, to, to, it, to be able to drive an EV when there isn't just ubiquitous fa- um, fast charging everywhere, you're going to need to have, you know, a house with a charger that's readily available. And I just I just don't know if that's the majority um, of the market today. And again, everything I'm saying is I have no horse in this race. For yeah, me, no, it's more. It. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm more so curious, like what happens next. Yeah, I actually think that that the the toughest part, some of the toughest part about EV adoption is going to be urban environment where there's like parking is at a premium and getting new getting new power sort of like threaded to parking lots and parking garages is more challenging. I think the, the the first wave of this happens in the suburbs where everyone has, you know, a two car garage and, you know, enough uh, panel space, space to put in a charger. Um, that's like all that can happen today. You know, again, with the infrastructure we have and the driving distances are about right. I actually, I actually kind of think that, that, uh, that rural environments where you, where there's plenty of space and you can just plug in, you know, even though the, the distances are longer, uh, you know, I think like, I think that if it's, if, if you have your, you have your F-150, your, you know, gas car, uh, gas truck, and then you have your, you know, your, your car just run errands in. And the fact that you don't have to buy gas anymore for that car, like I, that, that pencils to me. I mean, even, yeah, even I hate filling up gas. I absolutely hate it. It's the, it's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. And even like gas prices are down, right? No, gas prices are down from where they were a year or so ago when it was like $6 a gallon and it's still, but it's still four to four bucks a gallon where I live. So like, it's not pleasant, you know? No, and like, but you know, it's funny and <laughs> not, not to sound, not to sound pretentious, but like the, actually the, the prices is like, I'm less sensitive to that. I, for me, it's the the inconvenience of um, 
you know, it's not on any of my roots, unfortunately. And, you know, you're at home, there's the kids, you know, this one is, is this one's crying, this one <laughs> wants food or something or whatever you're doing. And it's yeah. like, oh shit, like I'm low on gas. I got to run out. So I make the best out of it, you know, whatever. It's a, it's a trip, but the time that, that I'm telling you, it's uh that, that does bother me. <laughs> no, again, in a year and a half, the only four times that I've you that I've, that I've had to charge my car on, you know, in public charging is when I've forgotten to do it overnight. Like that's it. You know, yeah. it's other than that, it's always like I always leave my garage full and I just drive past the gas station, like kind of flip it off every time, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So do, like do we have wireless chargers yet. When is that going to happen? Like, you know, you, you, you throw no, your iPhone. On the no, wireless like charger. honestly, <laughs> like I, I don't I've, I've really I've there's like some company that's doing like little robotic arms to like kind of seek and plug the thing in. I'm like what the fuck's the big deal? You, you just take the thing and you just plug it in. Like, how hard is that? Like, seriously, we need robots to it's do this? Happen. Or wireless if you charges? But if I, you would have told me that, the same thing for the iPhone, I would have told you, nah, it's not going to happen. It will happen. It will absolutely happen. I, I guess. I just don't see, like, I feel like that's like one of those things, like when you're not, when you don't own an EV yet, you're like, oh, I don't want to have to remember to plug it in. I don't have to like go and do that every time. No, first of all, I don't, you don't do it every day. I do, like plug it in every four days or five days or something like that. And, uh, and just goes overnight. And then I, I'm done in the morning. But it's just not like, it's just not a thing, you know, like it's easy to change that habit. And it's like way nicer than like you said, going to the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so you jumped to the funny question, which was, I was going to ask you what car you have. You clearly drive an EV now. Now, yeah. just here, let me understand. So when you started Recurrent, did you have yeah. an EV yet or not yet? Oh, you no, did already? So, no. So, so I lived in Seattle at the time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, that coastal elite comment hit a little close to home. But um, so I lived in Seattle at the time, no, 1923 house, no driveway, no garage, no off street parking on my side of the street, right? So it was a single family home. But okay. Like none so of the so rest that's of that. the investor story. That's the yeah. investor story. Yeah. No. So, so I, so I had, okay. uh, we had, we had, we had just had the, had the Subaru Outback that we, you know, parked and. And, uh, and then I only got the, I moved to Tacoma, Washington a year and a half ago and, uh, I have a garage for the first time since high school. So like, yeah, so I'm not like, Hey, I can plug it in now. So yeah, that's when I got one. And I love no, it. I'm love over it. here thinking like, I'm over here thinking about like the cognitive dissonance of, of, you know, running a company like Recurrent and not driving an EV at yeah. the beginning, at least, but probably was like a funny time period, but it was a funny story. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you think like, oh yeah, this is a used EV company. Like, oh, he must've had this experience of buying an used EV and then, and had a bad experience. No, I didn't like, it just like, I just saw how people are asking different questions and the industry wasn't answering them. And I'm like, that's going to hold back the used market. Like, that can't like somebody's got to fix that. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure. I can no, do this. You're, you're absolutely right. I think that's one of the biggest apprehensions that dealers have. It's the battery. So I think you're, you're on the right track, man. I love, I absolutely love what you're working on. Um, and you mentioned plug earlier. So I mean, tell us more like where for, for consumers, for, for dealers, for owners, right? I think anyone on this call that has any association with EVs in their life and whatsoever could benefit uh, from the software that you guys have created. So can you just tell us a little bit more where they can find out more about it? Yeah, for sure. So our website is recurrentauto.com. Um, if you are an EV owner today and you're listening to this podcast, you should come and sign your car up. Uh, it's free. Uh, you, you, we get some, you get some nice battery metrics, you know, uh, on a monthly basis. And then when you go to sell your car, you're going to be able to sell for hundreds or thousands of dollars more. Like that's our value prop right there. If you're a dealer, like we can help you essentially help you both on the acquisition side, you know, um, and on the retail side and that's working really well. And we're start really starting to scale that business. And then if you're a shopper, like, like you should, you know, sorry, this is our dealers, but you should be asking your dealer, like, hey, you shouldn't buy one of these without 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 looking at the recurrent report. Um, you're gonna get those questions. A lot of leading dealers are working with us now. We you can also see our stuff on Edmund, so that's like the first third party market uh, listings aggregator marketplace to uh, to include it's that. Huge. Yeah, so yep. like every uh, used EV. Um, uh, SRP and VDP uh, on Edmonds now sort of like has recurrent range information. They actually have a really cool map visualization that shows how far you can go from your home to like one way and round trip. Uh, it's, they've done a great job with it. So like, yeah, my friends are on like, yeah, where, where do I go to sort of like find uh, used EV listings? Yeah, I would send them there because they're they're doing it. They're doing it really well. They're the first ones. This is all, all off the record. <laughs> This is off the record, or Harley, you can keep this part on the record. I've had a walnut stuck in my tooth this entire 
episode. And I didn't want to stop Scott because he just had the groove going, the flow going. So that's what I've been dealing with this entire <laughs> yeah, episode. This is amazing. This is like the yeah. most entertaining part of the I would actually lead with this. Could you do like the, the teaser where it's like, yeah, I've had this I, fucking I, walnut so in my mouth. We need, we By need the way, something. here's Scott. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely have to leave this in. This is amazing. Um, Let's do and it. And maybe uh, you should it. do like a spot. Do you have sponsorships on this uh, podcast yet? So we have a we have a pretty healthy wait list. Uh, sponsorships are likely going to start over the next couple of podcasts. Yep. Yeah, first first sponsor of the podcast, the Walnut Growers Association of America. <laughs> there we go. I love it. <laughs> okay, so the question. So is, so back to the question, right? So yeah. back to the question. <laughs> what have you changed your mind on in the last couple of years? Um, I think that before I this is EV related, right? Is is, is it goes back to this charging thing? Like I thought um, that. Just from the outside, I thought that 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 long distance travel was like fine uh, with with EVs. I don't think it is today, unless you're uh, unless you're on the Tesla supercharger network. Um, and so I, I would say, like, not only what I say to to folks in northern climates, like, you know, don't buy an EV that doesn't have a heat pump. Like, do it Model Y. Do any of those Hyundai models? There's a couple others that have heat pumps in there. I'd say that pretty freely right now. That's um, some good alpha. Yeah, I, and uh, and then the second thing is, I would say, like, y- you know, before you like it, like I would absolutely everybody out there should have one of the, if they've got two cars, they should have one car that's an EV, hands down. It's great, the less gas, the whole thing. Um, before you go and replace your second car, though, where you're going to do road trips with it. I think either you got to be on a, a on a long range Tesla with the supercharger, or you or you, you got to wait a couple of years, like before that the the bit, until the rest of the charging network gets built out uh, to really make it fast, rely fast and reliable. You know, that's and there's a lot. I think there's a lot that's going to change. A lot that's going to change over the next couple of years. But that's sort of where I'm at. That is absolutely a good nugget, and that's another thing I didn't know. So that is great, Scott. Thanks so much for coming on. This was awesome. Had a ton of fun and learned a lot. So appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll do this again. Thank you. That was really fun. Good luck with that. Awesome. Walnut. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating, consider subscribing to the show and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.